Sutra, therefore, Puna. The three kinds of upside down continuity come from the light which is added to enlightenment. With this false enlightening of the knowing nature, subjective awareness gives rise to objective appearances. Both are born of false views, and from this falseness, the mountains, the rivers, the great earth, and all conditioned appearances unfold themselves in a succession that recurs in endless cycles. Commentary After the Buddha finished explaining the continuity of the world, the continuity of living beings, and the continuity of karmic retribution, he called to Purna again. Therefore, Purna, the three kinds of upside down continuity come from the light which is added to enlightenment. The continuity of the world is the arisal, dwelling, change, and extinction of the world, which goes on perpetually. Living beings go through a similar process of birth, dwelling, change, and extinction ceaselessly without end. Comic retribution also occurs with production, dwelling, change, and extinction forever and ever. These three kinds of continuity arise from ignorance. The world is established because of ignorance, so there is the ignorance of the world the ignorance of living beings, and the ignorance of karmic retribution. Every condition dharma arises from ignorance. Ignorance is the mother of all conditioned existence. Thus, if people can smash ignorance, they can see the dharma nature. Until you have smashed ignorance, you cannot see the dharma nature. Why is this world sustained by the three kinds of upside-down continuity? Adding light to fundamental enlightenment turns it into ignorance. With this false enlightening of the knowing nature, subjective awareness gives rise to objective appearances. With the birth of ignorance, an empty and false knowing nature comes into being and, because of it, the objective realm is perceived. Both are born of false views and from this falseness the mountains, the rivers, the great earth, and all conditioned appearances unfold themselves in a succession that recurs in endless cycles. Despite the vastness of the plains, forests, and all the magnet appearances, there is a definite sequence to it all, and never any randomness or disarray. Once this empty Falseness arises, it goes on and on, it finishes and then begins again, ends and then starts over. For instance, people die and then are reborn, and once born, they die again, and after death, they are born again. They keep turning around, yet people never wake up and wonder, why do I get born and then die, die and then get born? They don't look into this question, they never figure out why they get born and why they die. So. When they are born, they don't understand what's going on, and when they die, they're even more confused. So the saying, when you come, you are disoriented. When you go, you are confused. Since they are so unclear about their coming and going, you can imagine that their lives as people pass in the days as well. And it's just in this lack of clarity that the process continues. They are born and die, die and are born. Beautiful, what ultimate meaning is there in all of this? The ultimate meaning of being in this world is making a little money and eating a little food. You don't have any money, so you have to go to work. You make money in order to buy food and clothes. Really, if all there is to this life is eating, wearing clothes, and living in a nice house, it's really meaningless. It would be better to die right this minute. Think about it. You have to go to work, and when you come home, you have to eat. You have to keep trying to fill that bottomless pit. You fill it up today, and by tomorrow, it all has flowed out again. You fill it one day, and the next day is empty again, even to the point that you feel it in the morning and is hungry by noon. Again, you fill the hole, and by evening, you're hungry yet again. You had to move out the old to make room for the new. Going through such a lot of trouble every day seems totally meaningless. There's a poem that goes, From of old until today, 
Few people have lived past 70. First subtract the early years and then the years of age. Between the two, there's not much time that is left at all. And of that, remember, sleep takes up the better half. From ancient times until the present day, the number of people who have lived past 70 are very few. And in the early years, before one is 15 years old, one can't really do anything. Americans become of age at 18, but Chinese children still rely on their parents at 25. So first, you must subtract the early years. Someone says, my kid carries papers and makes money. Sure, but he can't make much. You can't really count that as carrying on a business. From the end of the lifespan, you also have to subtract 15 years, the years of old age. In the last 15 years, you are physically unable to do very much. Your eyes go bad, your ears get deaf, your teeth fall out, and your hands shake. You can't even get your legs to work right. Your four limbs are of no use anymore. So, if one lives to be 70, we take off 15 years at the beginning and 15 years at the end. There isn't much time left in between. There are 40 years left, but that is not 40 years of productiveness. Half of it is taken up in sleep. And then if you take into account going to the bathroom, putting on and taking off clothes, you have to subtract some more time. So at the very most, a human lifespan has about 20 productive years to it. So, what's so great about it? That reminds me of three old men who got together to celebrate New Year's. One was 60 years old, one was 70, and one was 80. These three old cronies went out, Dutch, to ring out the old and ring in the new. The 60-year-old said, This year we celebrate with wine and cheer. I wonder next year who won't be here. The 70-year-old said, you are thinking too far in the future. Oh, said the 60-year-old, what do you say about it? The 70-year-old said, tonight when I take off my shoes and socks, will I put them on again tomorrow or not? The 80-year-old said, you are looking too far ahead yourself. Well, what do you say about it? asked the 70-year-old. The 80-year-old said, I let out this breath of air and then I'm not sure if I ever breathe in again. These three old timers were looking into the question of birth and death. In the end, could they end birth and death if they had met a good knowing advisor, a bright eyed teacher, they still have had a chance. If they didn't encounter a bright eyed teacher, I believe they couldn't have ended birth and death. There's another incident that had bearing on this topic. Once there was a man who died and went before King Yama. So, as soon as he saw King Yama, he started to argue his case. He said, You're really inhuman. If you wanted me to come see you, you should have written me a letter. If you had informed me clearly in advance, I could have prepared. But you didn't write a letter or make a phone call or send a telegram to let me know. You just captured me without warning and I find that totally unreasonable. King Yama said to him, I sent you a lot of letters, you just didn't realize it. I never got any letters from you, the man protested. Yama said, the first letter I gave you was when your neighbor had a child that died at birth. You were already quite old, and if a newborn child could die, weren't you even more vulnerable? You should have waken up at that point and started to cultivate. And then didn't there come the time when your eyes went bad and you could no longer see clearly? That was the second letter. In time, your ears went deaf, right? That was the third letter. Wasn't there a point when your teeth fell out? That's that was the fourth letter. I didn't recognize the words of your letters, Yama. What was the last one you sent? Didn't you notice that your hair was getting white? That was the last letter. Now I see how much pork you have eaten, so you can go to rebirth as a pig. 
So the man turned into a pig. When would he get to be a person again? Nobody knows. Now that the continuity of comic retribution has been explained, everyone should return the light and look within the and figure out what he or she is going to do. Someone says, I know I'm going to leave the home life. You want to leave the home life? That's fine if you really do it. Someone else says, Hearing this, I think human life is really meaningless and I'd like to just lay down and die. That's alright too, but it's not for sure that you won't get sent off to be a pig like that old man was. Pigs are really dotish. So people who are downwitted become pigs in the future. And the whole reason for studying the Surakama Sutra is to learn how not to be a dot. It is to have your open your wisdom. If you have wisdom, the three kinds of continuity won't have anything to do with you. So you wonder, wouldn't it be unnatural if the wounds and living beings and comic retribution didn't have anything to do with me? No, because at that point you have a connection with the Buddhas. You are a relative of the, Bo of the Bodhisattvas and a brother or sister of your hearts. So you certainly won't be an anarchist. Sutra Pona said, If this wonderful enlightenment, this basic miraculous enlightened brightness, which is neither greater than nor less than the mind of the first come one, abruptly brings forth the mountains, the rivers and the great earth and all conditioned appearances, then now that the first come one has attained the wonderful empty bright enlightenment, Will the mountains, the rivers, the great earth, and all conditioned habitual outflows rise again? Arise again? Commentary Having heard Shakyamuni Buddha's explanation of the three kinds of upside down continuities, Puna had something else to say. If this wonderful enlightenment, this basic, miraculous enlightened brightness, which is neither greater than nor less than the mind of the first common, this refers to the nature of the treasury of the first common. On the part of a Buddha, the treasury of the first common does not increase, and on the part of living beings, it does not decrease. Living beings are replete with the basic miraculous enlightened brightness, just as the Buddha is, yet it abruptly brings forth the mountains, the rivers, and the great earth, and all conditioned appearances. Since that's the way it is, why, for no reason, do the mountains, the rivers, the great earth, and all the other conditioned appear appearances suddenly arise? You say that they arise from the treasury of the first come one. Why does that happen? There doesn't seem to be any reason for it. This session of taste voices the doubt that Puna has now. He wonders if living beings cause a mind that is, their Buddha nature has a beginning, and he wonders if the fruition of Buddhahood has an end. He's asking if there will be a time when the Buddha will no longer be a Buddha and will become a living being again. He says, then now that the first common has attained the wonderful, empty, bright enlightenment, will the mountains, the rivers, the great earth, and all conditioned habitual outflows arise again? Buddha, you don't have any leftover habits and you have extinguished your outflows. Would it be possible for you to give rise to conditioned outflows and habits in the future? You have already become a Buddha. Can you give rise to ignorance again? Living beings arise from ignorance. Draw a Buddha now. But in the future, could you become a living being again? This is what Puna was asking. His reasoning was this, the mountains, the rivers, the great earth, and everything else arise from ignorance. Before they came into being, there was fundamental enlightenment, the wonderful brightness of the enlightened nature, the fundamental enlightenment's bright wonder. Ignorance arose from true enlightenment. Therefore, now that the Buddha has become a Buddha, when will he again? give rise to ignorance. After one accomplishes Buddhahood, there is no more ignorance. 
A bodhisattva at the level of equal enlightenment still has ignorance, but it is slight. In fact, it would be hard to compare it to anything in order to show how little there is of it. Living beings have 84,000 afflictions which arise from ignorance, but a bodhisattva of equal enlightenment is comparable to a Buddha, except that he has not actually reached wonderful enlightenment, that is, Buddhahood. Bodhisattvas of equal enlightenment still have one particle of ignorance, which produces appearances that they have not destroyed. And this one particle is comparable to a mode of dust bordering on emptiness. Sutra The Buddha said to Purna, consider, for example, a person who has become confused in a village, mistaking south for north, is this confusion the result of confusion or of awareness? Purna said, this person's confusion is the result neither of confusion nor of awareness. Why? Confusion is fundamentally baseless. So how could it arise because of confusion? Awareness does not produce confusion. So how could it arise because of awareness? Commentary. The Buddha said to Purna, responding to his question, Consider, for example, a person who has become confused in a village, mistaking south for north. What was this person's situation? He got turned around, he lost his direction. Now in his confusion, when he mistakes south for north, does he in actuality lose south or north? No, south is still south and north is still north. It's just that the man has lost his sense of direction. Is this confusion the result, the confusion or of awareness? The Buddha asks. Puna said, this person's confusion is the result neither of confusion nor of awareness. It's not because of confusion that he gets confused, nor is it because of awareness that he gets confused. Why? Confusion is fundamentally baseless, so how could it arise because of confusion? Confusion doesn't even exist. How could confusion arise from confusion when there basically isn't any confusion to begin with? In the same way, basically people have no ignorance. So ignorance is not produced from ignorance. Ignorance is like a shadow. Light represents wisdom. Darkness represents stupidity. The ignorance is like a shadow. Our shadow is certainly not our body, but because there is a body, a shadow exists. When people turn their back on the enlightenment and unite with the defilement, there is ignorance. When they turn their back on defilement and unite with the enlightenment, there isn't any more ignorance. Ignorance is also like a reflection uh, in a mirror. There aren't any reflections in the mirror to begin with. So when a reflection appears, it is obviously not there just because the mirror exists. It appears when there is an appearance external to it. So ignorance does not arise in true enlightenment. The falseness arises relying on the true. Confusion is fundamentally baseless. It has, not, it has no root. How then can it produce confusion? A plant must have a seed in order to reproduce itself. But confusion has no seed and no root, so confusion can't be born from confusion. Nor does it arise from awareness. Why? Awareness does not produce confusion. So how could it arise because of awareness? Awareness here refers to enlightenment. And since enlightenment is the opposite of confusion, how could awareness give rise to confusion? 